This is the Seahawkers podcast, episode 345. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. What a great way to start the season, Brandon, and being able to talk about actual games and actual football and see what this team is actually going to do. And then we get the performance we did on this Sunday, which was a solid B plus a minus in. Could you hope for anything more out of a road season opener? I, don't I know that can. cannot complain at all about a 28 to 16 victory on the road. Like you said, to start the season, Pete Carroll for whatever happened to losing these East coast games, he's got it figured out now. Yeah. Yeah. You just start ignoring the time zones and not make it a big deal. And then it turns out to not be a big deal. I think he did something. I I think that he went to work with some voodoo magic because yeah. he talked to, or maybe he not slow talk the to. slow the earth's rotation and make it so that like, you know, the time feels like the same when they get there. Like, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. He did something. Mike Holmgren yeah. could never figure it out. Pete Carroll figured it out. Yeah. Wizard <laughs> <laughs> did something. It was an exciting game and there's lots to talk about. And I think, especially listening to the national perspective, uh, we've heard a lot about the offense and Russ and Tyler, right? And that's awesome. And I definitely want to talk about all that, but can we start where at what I think it was the coolest thing to see in this game? Can we start with the defensive line? Yes. Yeah. Let's start with the defensive line. Sweet. <laughs> Cause that was uh, everything that we had hoped for with the kind of style of defensive line that they built this year in terms of not necessarily having any one big star relying on some developmental talent, uh, having some higher end guys, but maybe not, you know, Von Miller or Aaron Donald and that the culmination of all of that would allow them to be both stout against the run and have a very effective pass rush. And if I, if you would ask me like, Hey, do you think that it's going to look like this right out of the gate? I probably wouldn't have said yes. No, no, I was not expecting it right out of the gate. I, I thought that the Colts would get a better performance week one out of Jonathan Taylor. And it's, it's nothing really against Taylor as much as it was the guys up front because they weren't they they weren't making the holes for him. So I definitely blame that Colts offensive line. And part of that is due to the way that the Seahawks defensive line played. You had Brian Monet making some big tackles. You had Kerry Hyder uh coming from behind and tackling Taylor, you know, short of the goal line along with Jamal Adams and saving a touchdown. It uh and then you had Daryl Taylor get this first NFL sack. Yeah. And then kind of the star of the show for the day, you had Rasheem green being moved to this new position and really taking to it And Pete Carroll's excitement seems to have uh, manifested itself on the field in Rasheem green's play. And he, he had a whale of a game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Tackle for a loss. He had the quarterback sack. He had two passes defensed, which I believe led the team. Yeah, it led the team. That's amazing. And then ben, Benson Mayo with a sack. And again, just it was scattered all across the board. Dunlap, you know, creating havoc. And should have had a sack, just, even though it was on a two point conversion where it doesn't actually count as a sack, which is dumb. It is dumb. And uh, yes, but exactly. Dunlap just was pissed coming, about that, too. He did a post game interview. And she was complimenting on him on the stop on the two point conversion. And he's like, yeah, but it's not like it's a real stat. <laughs> That's funny. I missed his presser. I listened to quite a few. Oh, I can't it, wasn't, I he, his... it wasn't in the, the post game presser. It was the, the one that it was one of the ones that show up on Seahawks.com. As oh, the, what like the locker room, the, like the post game uh, radio yeah. broadcast interviews. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But that was, that was fun to see. I mean, that the defense with the front seven playing like that, that they can hold their own because the offensive line for the Colts is supposedly good, especially in the interior. I know they have some injuries at the tackle position, but you expected them to be able to consistently get a little more push, at least up the middle. And it looked like the Hawks were knocking them back off the ball almost every snap and the energy was high. 
and it allowed uh, enough pressure on Car- Carson Wentz to make the secondary look adequate. Yeah, it was just enough pressure on Wentz. He had the one good drive to start the game where they got him down to the uh, inside the 10 yard line. They ended up having to kick a field goal. It was because of that tackle I mentioned by Kerry Hyder. And it probably it wouldn't even got to that if Jamal Adams, man, that was so close. That was so close with his offside penalty. Yeah, it was super tight. But I mean, you, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? And that's the way that Jamal does things. He's really good at timing up the snap and. They got him on it. I mean, I, I think it was offsides. I think it was probably the right call. He, but was, it was, he was in was the tight. neutral zone, I think. He was he, he was trying to time up the snap. And I think Corbin Smith posted the video of how he was he was onside when the clock hit zero. But there's that right. just fraction of a second that they, they allow from when it's zero to when they throw the penalty flag. Right. And he had just moved into the neutral zone as they were snapping it. And yeah, it was that close. It was, it was bang, bang, but yeah, you can hardly blame him for that. He looked good throughout the game. He was flying around in the backfield. They were bringing him on blitzes now and then. Um, I really enjoyed the play of Wags and Jordan Brooks. Um, I mean, 13, I, 13 tackles for Bobby Wagner, 11 tackles for Jordan Brooks. Brooks had that nice. It was I don't think it went down as a pass defense, but the position that he was in, if, yeah. if that ball would have hit the hands of the of the tight end, he would have been knocking it out. Absolutely. He he was so fast on the field. Like I was wanted to talk about Brooks more because he impressed me so much. And not to take anything from Wags, like everything that he did was amazing. And I was just like, yeah, that's what he does. So cool. Um, on to Brooks, who we were unsure about a little bit. And I mean, just played a whale of game seems to understand his position and where he's supposed to be very well and playing really fast. And you combine that with actual natural physical speed. And uh, it, it just looked right. It really did. Well, if you're talking about guys who are flying around the field, Quandre Diggs, he yeah. was flying around and making big hits. Yeah. It's going to take me a minute to get used to the the single digit number on him, but <laughs> He was laying the wood to people, man. Like that was awesome to see And just really the team as a whole, the tackling and the hitting was well done. I mean, it was right on the edge, uh, but they, you know, they were playing physical, but not creating a lot of penalties. And it was just, it was awesome, man. Okay. Let's talk numbers for just a second, because seeing digs in number six, wasn't as jarring to me as two other numbers. It was weird for me to see DJ Reed wearing two after watching mm-hmm. Akella Witherspoon wear two in the preseason. Gotcha. And then seeing Benson Mayo wear number 10. Yeah, that one. You know what the oddly the one that's kind of jarring to me is Hyder in 51. It gets <laughs> right. me every time. I don't know so, why. Why is Bruce out there? Yeah, it's not even Bruce. It's just like, and who's 51 again? <laughs> like, because it just doesn't like if he was wearing 92, right? Yeah. Or, or 73. Like I, I would, every time I saw it, I wouldn't have to re remind myself. Oh yeah. That's one of our D linemen. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a linebacker number. You think Lofa Tatupu, you think Bruce Irvin. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. I, and yeah, Carlos Dunlap and eight, that's not weird to me. So I, I, there's no real reason to reason. what looks weird and what doesn't look weird. <laughs> No, no, it's just whether or not it fits on him. See, I felt like two look good on DJ Reed. That that felt right to me. Yeah, it it looks. I'll get used to that one. It's mm-hmm. just I there was you know just some uh, residue left over from Akella wearing it that it just it hit me wrong. Right, no, no doubt. Well, well, speaking about DB, should uh, Flowers change his number? I don't know. Would that help? Would it? Because there's nothing really that bothered me from Flowers' play. Just one play. And it happened to be a touchdown. Yeah, that didn't bother me. That was... A, that the, didn't bother you? It was an that all-out blitz. Me. It was an all-out blitz. Yeah. And they ran and a slant. And put a hand on the freaking receiver on the line of scrimmage? Yeah, well... That bothered the hell out of me. He, fa- he, he uh, feigns off coverage until the last possible second, runs up on the receiver to play press man, and then doesn't lay a hand on him, lets him have a free release, and then it's curtains. Well, yeah, the pass rush has to get there. I, 
he yeah, had I know. no help. And you know what buys you longer in getting the pass rush there? You jam that dude. Sure. Yeah. I, ideally, yes. But every time there's no ideally about it. It's technique. At least get a hand on him. Like uh, make him make him change his his route just a little bit. Okay. Well, I was not expecting Trey Flowers to do anything but Trey Flowers things. And so when you send everybody and you don't yeah. get to the quarterback, that is the risk that you take when you run that play defensively. It's true. It, it, it is true. But yes, I think one of the things that I came away with is the secondary can be adequate enough if this defensive line can continue to perform on this sort of level throughout the season. Because the other thing about that take. touchdown too is that they're already up 28 to 10. So I know the, the game was over. I know. I know. But still, that was that was the one thing, honestly, out of most of the defensive plays throughout the day that bothered me. Everything else, short of giving up a third and 12 uh, in the third quarter, that was kind of annoying. Um, but again, that you're now you're getting to the picking nits thing. Right. And yeah. Because in the third quarter, they kept uh, you know, the Colts off the board while Seattle went through their one dry spell there on offense. So, which we can get to here in a little bit, but uh, it was nice complimentary football that way. They stepped up the most when it was needed the most. They gave up one annoying third down, but they were five for 13 on third down stops. And they stopped all three fourth down. Yeah. Plays. Yeah. And I think the other encouraging thing regarding the defense is, is that Carson Wentz didn't look like trash in that game. No, no, he actually looked okay. He looked okay. <laughs> he looked like a guy who's knocking off the rust a little bit for sure, but also as well. I mean, what do you expect the guy to do when he's under that much pressure? Yeah. Not, not being able to get the run game going. Braden Smith's mm -hmm. getting run over by Daryl Taylor. That, that was, was fun. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness goodness that's that's that flash of high-end talent that should get you excited about taylor i mean that was i mean he dump trucked him <laughs> he did that was one of my favorite plays uh brian monet on uh it, it wasn't even a play because it was a false start but he, he just pushed the center right back into carson Wentz just as the time was clicking down in the third quarter and uh that was that was fun <laughs> Yeah, he basically used the uh, center as like a uh, cue ball and knocked him <laughs> into the eight ball, which or the two ball, I guess, which was uh, Carson Wentz. You see him go backpedaling. That was I wasn't was I wasn't even mad about the penalty. It just it was I fun wasn't to watch. Either. It was it was fun to watch. Okay, well we we covered the defense. Why don't we Why don't we do special teams then before we go to the offense? Let's talk Michael Dixon for okay. a little bit. Okay, uh, what was that? when he did the run around thing, was that a bobbled snap or was that an actual fake? No, it wasn't a fake. It was from what it looked like. It looked like the left side was collapsing. And then there was another guy that stunted around and was coming from the right side unblocked. And so I think he, he was worried that it was about to get blocked. And so mm. he, he bumped out to the right and did you see where that ball was when he kicked it? It looked like it was either about to bounce or yeah. it was right at the ground. Yeah. I thought it was a drop kick at yeah, first. It looked but like it was. It, it wasn't. And then not only that, but like where he ended up putting it was pretty impressive considering <laughs> all the factors going on around him. I think it was still inside the 20. It was at least inside the 30. I know that for a fact. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, wow. Okay. Uh, that worked out. Um, yeah. solid on all the rest of his punts. Uh, I thought uh, kickoff and punt coverage was both excellent, uh, throughout the game. Um, yeah, it was, I think an under two yard return average on punts. Yeah. And the return game left a lot to be desired for Seattle. Yes. Okay. That's fine. We're again, we're getting down to picking nits in that case. Uh, absolutely. Like if we're breaking down special teams, that yeah. would be kind of if my John Radigan is going to thump a dude and, and make the tackle for just a two yard gain. I want that football coming out from a West point grad. <laughs> he should know the tactical advantage of creating fumbles there. That's right. Yeah. Do better, John. Exactly. How dare you come in and make a great play and inspire everybody and, and not get the turnover. Yeah. 
jerk. Yeah. Well, he was rewarded with uh, a signing off the practice squad this week. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah, they, they signed him up to the active roster. Nice. Awesome. I like to see that. And then uh, Myers was Myers, man. He made all of his extra made points. His, so. his kicks. Yeah. I, I don't know what else to say. Oh, well, I guess I do know what else to say. Um, Tyler Ott, freaking money all <laughs> night. Every one of those long snaps were like, they were gold. I give Tyler Ott an A++. I, I don't think we had to go there. I mean, it's like Bobby Wagner. Tyler Ott was just being Tyler Ott. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> On to the offense, and we could talk about individual players, but what about the biggest concern coming into this game being offensive coordinator Shane Waldron never having called offensive plays in the regular season? Yes, we saw it in the preseason. Preseason doesn't matter. But now, I, I don't think we have to be worried that if he can or can't call plays. It was such a cool mix of plays. And the other thing about it that most people aren't talking about is like, oh, Russ had a huge day, you know, blah, 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 blah. He didn't throw the ball that much. And we ran the ball quite a bit with a huge amount of effectiveness. Like that was awesome. I loved seeing that. And it felt like it all flowed, right? It yeah. wasn't, it didn't ever feel like anything was forced. It, it felt slow in the third quarter. Right. And I want to get to that in a minute because I went back and watched the, especially the third quarter to be like, what happened here? Yeah. Like, did we get figured out? Like, what was going on? And I've got some thoughts. Okay. But, uh, my, you know what I was most excited about when it comes to the offense and philosophy and all of that? What's that? There were so many gimmies for Russell Wilson and Russ took them <laughs> instead of just staring down DK deep. Like he was, how many times did he check down to the back? A, a few because Chris yes. Carson had, let's see, three targets, all three catches, 26 yards. Yeah, it was, it just felt like th that little flare, you know, out in the flat. We, we never saw that in Shoddy's offense. How many times were we talking about that when it came to cover two beaters? Yeah. Like we're, we were screaming for that. Just do that. Or like yeah. Will Disley. Throwing it out to him and letting him drive dudes right into the ground. Dude, best play of the game. <laughs> I was trying to save that to the very end. That was, I got, I was so jacked up watching that as I sat at the bar watching out my iPad in uh, Mississippi. You can't, yeah. we couldn't have saved that to the end. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That was a man's move. I was watching with my uh, coworker, Alec, who's not really a football fan. Uh -huh. And uh, he's like, dang. He's like, he, he thought that was impressive. And I was like, that dude's from Montana. And he goes, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uncle Will with the highlight of the day. But, you know, there were other highlights, too. How about Tyler Lockett catching the first touchdown pass of the season for the Seahawks? Look like they're playing single coverage outside. Russell looking for the snap. He gets it. Here comes the blitz. Russ going to let it fly down the middle of the field. Lockett is there. He's got it. Touchdown, Seahawks. Tyler Lockett, we love you, baby. Looks back over his shoulder and finds a beautiful rainbow pass from Russell Wilson against the blitz. A 23-yard touchdown strike, and the Seahawks go on top 6-3. If you throw the ball in the vicinity of Tyler Lockett, and he is standing in the end zone, he's catching the football. Even if <laughs> even if he can barely find it, he, he manages to find it. And uh, that, that was insane. That was an insane catch. It's amazing that we get our first touchdown pass of the year for the Seahawks, and it's probably going to end up being one of the top five touchdown catches you see all year. Like th that whole Willie Mays style thing, you know, looking over your shoulders with the helmet on, like that's what's so incredibly difficult about it. And you can kind of see him look over his left shoulder and locate it and then flip his shoulders and everything, get around and then just lay his head back. Like he's doing the catfish in limbo and haul in the ball. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how he did it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you do. I just, I just told you how <laughs> you, you just broke it down and I still don't yeah. know. Yeah. But then he wasn't done. Tyler Lockett, 69 yard touchdown reception to help close out the first half. Second down and 20. Russ steps up in the pocket and he's going to let fly deep downfield. Got a man open. Lockett, 10 5, stumbles. He's in. Touchdown, 
Seahawks on a second down and 20 after a sack. Russell Wilson rears back and lets it fly. 69-yard touchdown. Tyler Lockett, his second score of the day. Holy catfish. This offense is explosive. That was super fun. And the most fun part about that is that it came against cover two. Yes. And to watch the Colts play a healthy amount of cover two, and then to have Waldy have all the offense or all the uh, answers and Russ being able to execute them was so cool. Like there were some levels concepts there that were being run on that play. I, I didn't go back and look at it enough, but enough to hold the safety and like Tyler, that move, such a, that move that Tyler put on the safety though was, yeah, <laughs> That's what, that's what made that play. Yeah. It was so, uh, I guess for the average layman, like fan watching, it doesn't look like a lot. It really doesn't. Yeah. But then you factor in the speed that he's moving at and just that one little jab step. And then I mean, it, it got that guy hook line and sinker. I mean, he had no chance after that. Uh, it's such a subtle uh, it, and that's how his whole game is. It's so subtle that way. It's not breathtaking in like the way that maybe Randy Moss did it or like Terrell Owens, like getting out of breaks and, and things like that. Like you're just like, Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's impressive. Right. And it's just so fluid with Tyler. Yeah. He makes it look easy. And then yeah. Russ puts it in the perfect spot and he can run under it in stride and take it all the way to the end zone. I really enjoyed uh, Russ talking with Peyton and Eli at the end of the Monday night game and them talking about that play and Eli popping the joke that like, well, you know, what'd you throw it? 60 yards of the air is like, yeah, that wouldn't have worked for us. Like we, we could only throw it 40 max <laughs> and like Peyton kind of jokes. He's like, yeah, that sort of thing hurt my arm. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. I, I want to see that more. I, I don't want to hear Russ talking about his mentality in certain situations though. That feels like he's given stuff away. Oh, for sure. I, I had that uh, sense. I, I do want to get more to that later because okay. uh, I think that was a, a fun thing. The, that whole telecast, but it was a fun um, game. It that- was a fun game. Yeah. So Tyler has the big catch. And then, I mean, we'd be remiss to not bring up the great Chris Carson, Chris Carson, 16 carries 91 yards. And the one play, I mean, the 33 yard run when they just needed one yard on third down. Yeah. Breaking tackles, running angry. It was a, you know, it was cover zero all out blitz. And he got through that uh, first wave in, then it was off to the races and he can only race so far because he's Chris Carson, but it at least was 30 yards, but he ran tough all day. He was, yeah. I mean, there was a play. I want to say it was in the third quarter where he gets strung out outside and like lots of penetration. And then he just decides, well, I'm not taking a big ass loss on this and just goes forward with everything that he had, like dead nuts, straightforward. Like I always am yelling at people on the screen to do and just plows over two, three guys and turns it into a three yard game. And those are the plays that don't get talked about much, but that's what makes Chris Carson. Great is he eliminates so many of those, uh, you know, one yard gains, turns them into a three or four yard gain in on a regular basis in that keeps you ahead of the sticks. He did have the one fumble though. He did in after last year. I mean, that'd be one of those things that at first it pops in your mind. Like, Oh no, did he catch the fumbles again? But after going back and watching it, he was right. As Leonard comes in, he's covering it up with his other arm, his off arm. He's, yeah. he's bringing it in to Leonard cover the had ball. to hit a spot about the size of a baseball with his yeah. fist. And he nailed it and he nailed it hard. Yeah. And I don't care who you are. You're not holding on to that. That just, that's just not happening. Yeah. It was just perfect shot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't mad at it. I mean, at the time I, I could see at the time that he, it was just a perfect strike. You get a little bit mad because it's a turnover, but yeah. Yeah. And you feel the offense struggling there a little bit and. Um, this was another thing that was so awesome about this game and reassuring to a Seahawks fan was how many, uh, this is the story of every single Seahawks game. You are either, you know, you get into the third quarter 
And you know, it's, it's time to like bury an opponent, right? You happen to get up early. You, you, and the offense goes in a drought, the defense gives up a score or two, and now you're in a dog fight, you're either down you know, a score or you're up a score and you're hanging on for dear life, going down the stretch in the fourth quarter. And I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting for that shoe to drop. And the defense did their part. And then the offense did finally figure it out. The, the time where the shoe would have dropped would have been after that fumble by Chris Carson. Because I mean that had the ability to turn it. It was right at the mid. Uh, it was right at the middle of the field. Uh, right after that, they he does a little dump off pass to Taylor. They pick up 15 yards. They cross midfield. They're they're at the Seahawks 40, and then three consecutive plays. Brian Monet is in on the stop. Uh, Quandre Diggs comes in on third down and just lays a, a thumping on Hines uh, to to give him the fourth and one. And then that's when Wentz fumbles the snap. DJ Reed picks it up and the Seahawks ball again. And Jamal Adams had an awesome Superman there. Yeah. I think if Wentz actually keeps the snap and stands up just a half a tick, he may not have a head anymore. Yeah. It's probably better that, that Wentz fumbled it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another really cool bright spot for me throughout the game was the use of the tight ends. How great was that to see? It was it was cool. And we, one of the first plays where I thought, ooh, that's a little bit different is when they ran the tight end screen to Gerald Everett early on in the in the first quarter. Yep, it was it was really neat. There was so much creativity. Um, there was a goal line run with Penny, I believe. And they brought both Tyler and DK on like an orbit action around back behind the quarterback. So like it was a fake to they handed it to Penny, a fake to Tyler, and then another fake to DK. And you're looking at that and you're going, that was interesting. What is that setting up? Why, why is that on film? Yeah. It it is. Yeah. It's setting it up for later. And I I do there were there were plays like that under under Bevel and and under Shoddy, mm-hmm. but I don't think it was enough to where you made defenses really have to worry about it. No, we're we're starting at week one. There was all sorts of misdirection, which I liked. The fly sweep action was in effect uh, in not a ton of it, but like enough that you have to honor it. I thought the balance of using that was really good. And then also to use it not only with Eskridge, but also to use Swain, right? So now you've got, well, okay, when this personnel is on the field, then it's, you know, the fly sweeps in and play. Well, now there's a different set of personnel on the field. Well, oh, I guess it's still in play. Like, it's just little things like that that make it hard for the defensive coordinators when they go into game week against Seattle. Yeah, and I was assuming that Swain would be a part of that. And it's a good thing that he is because now Eskridge is out uh, with a concussion after taking a big hit. Dude just needs to go out of bounds rather than try and turn it upfield into a linebacker. But it's un- it's unfortunate that his welcome to the NFL rookie uh, hit resulted in a concussion. It I'm is. definitely bummed out about that because he looked good out there. He looked like he belonged. He looked like he could be a, a fun part of this offense and uh, I'm looking forward to having him back. But uh, Everett, I thought had a, a great uh, initial game. I mean, he had the touchdown on the drag route uh, in again, it was just a good concept running guys off, putting people in a bind. It was, it was just great. Yeah, it's weird because I thought he had more than just two catches, but it was the one screen and it was the the touchdown pass. He had another catch that went for a big gainer, but oh, it was called back. Called back. Yeah, uh, but that was like, oh, wow, look at that. Um, That's right. And, and Disley coming up with some nice catches, at, at kind of crucial times and playing tough. Um, All three yeah, of his that, catches were for first downs. Mm-hmm. His, uh, you know, the addition of Parkinson, if he ever gets back on the field, like that's a real group of really talented guys. Unfortunately, with other injuries, we talked about Deskridge, uh, Penny Hart also had a concussion. Rashad Penny's hurt again. And Ethan Posick went to the IR uh, after only playing, gosh, a little over a dozen snaps in this game. All right. Well, this will be a decent time to talk about Posick for just like a half a second. Um, I'll have to talk about some other things in succession to get there. But again, uh, Rashad Penny, her, um, oh, my stars. I'm really 
surprised and shocked. Uh, but that third quarter drought, like going back and looking at that being like, Oh man, did they just get figured out? Like what, or were they not clicking or what was going on? And it was, I, I don't remember the exact order of the possessions, but it went something like this first possession. They end up with a third and four and Russ, uh, tries to hit Tyler down the sideline and Tyler hasn't beat and it's a perfect throw. It was a little short. And the, a hair, a hair in the DB made in a really great play to, to knock that down like eight times out of 10, seven times out of 10. That's a catch. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, okay. That dr- that drive fizzles out. Um, and then it might've been that next drive where they're in third down and, Posick just gets beat by uh, Buckner. Buckner. He got beat badly. And look, the Forrest Buckner is one of the five best defensive tackles in the league. Pretty easy. Probably top three. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the weakest part of our offensive line. And sometimes you just get got. Otherwise, it did a pretty good job of keeping Buckner at bay throughout the game. So like, okay, all right. So they made they made two plays. It wasn't necessarily that the scheme wasn't working or they had kind of bogged down and fill out a rhythm. Right. And then they end up with uh, another third down and six. The fumble was I, the, the next possession. Okay. I didn't know. Okay. I thought it was the other way. So yeah, the fumble was the next possession again, just another great play uh, by the defense. It wasn't anything uh, that was done wrong necessarily. It's just, they made a play. And then this was the one that bothered me out of the four. Uh, it was third and six. And uh I think it was a, an all out blitz and Russ just heaves it up down the sideline. You know, one of his giant chunk shots on third and short that or third and medium that just drive you kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, that we saw so many times last yeah, year. Yeah. That was right after. Uh, so it was second and four and they set up the screen and I, I'm guessing Russ just saw that the defense had the screen figured out and threw it yes. into the ground. Yeah. That's exactly how it looked to me. Yeah. So no, it wasn't as if like Waldy hit a uh, rough patch there or Russ, like all of a sudden reverted to the last season form or uh, the Colts had made some adjustment and we were struggling with it. No, it Uh, wasn't even like they were going run heavy and not having success with it because all of the Chris Carson runs were successful for the, for the most part in uh, apart from his fumble. Absolutely. Yeah. He ran well all night. So I didn't get, during the game, I was starting to get discouraged, but having gone back and watched it, uh, definitely don't feel discouraged about that little section, especially when they follow it up in the fourth quarter with another touchdown to basically put the game on ice. Russell from the shotgun again, takes a quick snap, pump fakes, looks, fires inside, reaching up, making the catch, Metcalf, touchdown, Seahawks on a slant route inside, man to man, you cannot cover DK Metcalf. He scores from 15 yards out. The Seahawks increase their lead to 27 to 10. That was a dart too. Oh man, and in perfect position, up high and away where only DK could get it because it wasn't terrible coverage. No. It's just DK is an animal. So good luck stopping that. And that was cool too. I mean, we saw a number of slants throughout the game. We saw him work the middle of the field. We saw him work outside the numbers. We saw him work in the flat. We saw him work, you know, the whole range of the field. Everything was being tested. Everything was being utilized in where it felt like last year, we just got stuck working outside the numbers deep. Right. Yeah, it it was nice to see the variety. And like I said, that takes me back to how we started. This was that Shane Waldron can call plays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, again, it's one game, but I'm excited. Like that's all of the check marks that I needed to see in the first game. It's all, I almost feel like it's too good and (laughs) like it's fool's goal. Right. But for reals, like, I mean, all the things we sat and rang our hands about throughout the, out the season, we see it come together the way that philosophically we were told it would. Right. Yeah. The, the other, I mean, the concern is still center, but Kyle Fuller can be okay. He can be okay. And the rest of the line is pretty darn good. It seems. And Russ was, you know, the, the weird stat coming out of this was how much 
Russ was pressured in this game because I didn't feel like he was under all that much duress in this game. And maybe that is like a little PTSD as a Seahawks fan, like watching Russ just get bum rushed for five seasons in a row that if you get mediocre pass rush, like you're like, dude, it was awesome. We had great. <laughs> we had great. It was, pass great protection. it was great protection. Yeah. Uh, I, I think maybe that's how it, it kind of feels. Russ but. did look like a guy though, playing his first game of the season. There were a couple of times where the pass rushers were coming in pretty hot and he kind of, you know, did his best to turn his back at the last moment and you know, just trying yeah. to protect himself. But, and you want I him think, to do that, but it just, it, it looked like he was, you know, a guy experiencing that for the first time of the season. Absolutely. But also year 10 and knowing, Hey man, I don't have to just take these shots square on. If I can protect myself just a little bit it, when they're coming, cause they're inevitably going to come, then I can prolong my career longer. Right. And yeah, just playing smart. I mean, Russ played so smart throughout the entire game and four touchdowns. Uh, and like you said, they're super efficient, 18 to 23 and just 250 yards. But it, yeah, it's that four touchdown number. He is 19th all time in the NFL right now. In touchdowns? In touchdowns. Wow. Two career and touchdowns behind some guy named Joe Montana. He was so so I hear. Yeah. People, people talk about him like he was good. I don't know. Some people say this word legend and I get really confused about it, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, sneaking up on the legendary Joe Montana. Good Lord, man. That's amazing. And he's got so much further to go. Uh, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. One thing I, I would ask you this, Brandon, did that not feel like the perfect marriage between Russ ball and Pete ball? It feel, it felt pretty good. I, if they could, I, hmm. Yeah, if they could just if if and if he would have hit Tyler on the one play where it was the great defense, he would have been over three hundred. Yeah, which I guess fine, whatever. Um, yards, yards don't hey, matter. Yards matter to people. Dak Prescott had this amazing game for the Cowboys where he threw for a bunch of yards this weekend. Dude, coming off that leg injury, that was an amazing game. I don't want to even come <laughs> close to crapping on Dak uh, after that. That was impressive, uh, considering. Yeah. Well, he threw yeah. it, you know, 55, 60 times. So. I don't care. That, too, just being able to do that. Yeah. Like, hats off to him. Like, I, obviously, that's not a sustainable way to win over a season, but, um, or even that game, apparently. But, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I just happy for him, for sure. I, uh, you, you know what? I'm, I'm glad Dak is back and healthy. I could, yeah. I could, I don't care if the Cowboys, well, I, I really don't want them to win. So uh, I was going to say that that was the perfect outcome. Like I actually like Dak. I think he's a good dude. So he had like some personal success and is overcoming the and lost. then the Cowboys still lose. Yeah. I just, <laughs> Although what, it's what, Brady winning. I, so I, I mean, it's a tough game to root for. <laughs> I don't have that kind of hate towards Brady that a lot do. I, you know what? Now that he is the age that he is in the NFL, yeah, it's it's kind of like pulling for the old man. Like Dude, I, I had this, I had the same thing with Joe Montana late in his career. Like when he was with the 49ers and they were win everything, I was like, oh, you know, screw the 49ers, they always win everything. But then when he went to the Chiefs, and it's like, okay, I could, I yeah. can get with this. Yeah, I look, he's one of the few players in the NFL that is uh, older than us at this point. Like I, I have to. I root. think he's the only one. <laughs> yeah. And it feels good. It feels good to see somebody of our uh declining uh physical skills out there. <laughs> yeah. D declining physical skills, just like ours. Tom Brady. Yeah. God, he was throwing the ball good too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We we'll get to the rest of the league on the second half All of the right. show here, but uh it just that was such a, a cool offensive performance. You definitely saw that the flavors of that Ram style scheme only with uh, an actual running back and actual running game to go with it. And it looks pretty dangerous. I hope it can continue to look dangerous against the Tennessee Titans because they made the Arizona Cardinals offense look dangerous against the Titans D. Yeah. Well, Look, that game, I just got done watching it on the condensed version. I watched and it too. It was, uh, it's fairly simple. 
they got up on the Titans right quick. They were up uh, 10, nothing or whatever it was. Uh, and the Titans of Duran five plays. Mm-hmm. I yeah, mean, because they decided not to block Chandler Jones. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They just, and so they he just, just has turn- a free run at Tannehill clobbers him and they pick it up for an easy touchdown right at the beginning of the game. Okay. All right. Can I do my Chandler Jones rant? Like right now, <laughs> if you want to, he yeah, had a good well, game. He, okay. So he is, uh, who's the Grady Jarrett of the Falcons? The, the guy who he always has like that one game a year. We just tear up uh-huh. and then everybody's like, well, he's a great talent even though he disappears for the 16 other games of the season, uh-huh. that is Chandler Jones in a nutshell. He just got his out of the way early. Cause he's pissed about his contract. And then not only that, like one of the five sacks, they just were like, Oh no, would you like a free sack? Here you are Chandler. Let me, let me serve that up on a platter for you. He had some other good ones too, where it wasn't just the, the come in and clean up the sack. I, I think there was some, some venom there for him not getting his deal. Yes, for sure. He had a couple legit sacks that were very well done, but again, he doesn't string that together consistently over a season. It's always like one outburst. And then yeah, it's always four sacks against the Seahawks. Then another four sacks against the Seahawks. Yeah. Isn't it nice to see him get it out against the Titans early? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one of those games, we won't have that Chandler Jones. That's what I'm thinking. (laughs) I'm thinking that they got that out, but so very simply, they got the Titans down big early. And when you do that, their offensive coordinator, uh, their new offensive coordinator got spooked. He got away from Derrick Henry and they started throwing the ball a bunch. And while Tannehill made some nice throws around the yard here and there, you could see that if you're going to hang your hat on Tannehill, like you're not going to win. It's just, it's just not good enough. Well, they were just able then to release the pass rush. And with the guys that they have up front on that Cardinals defensive line, the, the fact that they're, they got just good enough coverage on the back end of that Cardinals defense that they, they could shut them down. Yeah. Cause you could see Tannehill like was basically going for curls all day. Everything was underneath, whether it was a curl from the wide receivers or they ran everybody off with the wide receivers and then snuck Derrick Henry out late and hit him in the middle of the field or a tight end or something like that. Little check downs and things like that. I mean, Tannehill looked as average as ever and yeah, you take away the run game in Derrick Henry through either outscoring him really quickly and the, give the Cardinals credit. They shut down Henry on that first drive and a half, like pretty quickly. And, you know, from that point, you're hanging your hat on Tannehill. I, I wouldn't put all that blame on Tannehill for being average, though. Uh, Luan was getting blown up the entire game. Their whole offensive line didn't look good. No. So I, I I can't put I think with a a, a decent offensive line Ryan Tannehill's a, an actually a, a better than average quarterback. Yeah, I I would take him above Matt Ryan. True, okay. but Matt Ryan's not an average quarterback. <laughs> what you, is mediocre? Not average. Um, bad is bad. Well, he's he's not even Matty mediocre anymore. He's Matty no. bad. He's Matty batty. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, did you watch any of the the Eagles game with no, the Falcons? No, I didn't. Look, I this somebody I, I listened to a different podcast and somebody put it very well. And I wish I uh had said this myself earlier. But basically they're like, Yeah, Matt Ryan's just kind of that dude that's you know, he's like a Matt Schaub kind of guy, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just progressively getting worse and worse and worse every year. And now he's legit bad. All right. Well, again, that's probably second half of show material. We we could talk yeah. more about the Titans. We got we got a team to preview here. Absolutely. Uh, so it was tough to get a real gauge on what this Titan offense would really look like if they're playing on schedule and their type of football. Um, I mean, one we, thing we I can do say, we can expect though that well they they do have a new offensive coordinator, but I I think we can expect that what they want to do is they want to be able to run the football with Derrick Henry and then set up passes off of that. Oh, of course. It's just what type of passes in terms of route concepts and what levels of the field they're looking to attack and what if that is any different than last year. Sure. But the basic philosophy, yes, you're 100% correct. It's run the hell out of Derrick Henry, set up play action, and where Tannehill seems to thrive. And I guess the receiver that you really have to worry about is Chester Rogers 
with 62 yards. Yeah. Uh, big game with him, but you, you do have to admit that AJ Brown looked good. I mean, he, he looks like a real deal NFL receiver for sure. Oh yeah. The competition's on between AJ Brown and DK Metcalf, the former teammates. Yes, for sure. Um, this was my one worry regarding their receiving core, uh, coming into this game because of karma. Um, me talking bad crap about Julio Jones throughout the, the off season. Oh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but just saying like, he's not Julio anymore. He's just kind of a guy like Randy Moss on the 49ers. Yeah. Um, he looked that way against the Cardinals, but this might be the game where he comes out, just shoves it in my face. So if that happens, I'm apologizing in advance. Yeah. Julio probably listening to you and, uh, putting those clips up in the, in the locker. I don't know how you I'm do that. Even, you print out the transcript of this show and and then post it in the locker. I'm not even saying he knows the comments personally. I'm just saying like you put the juju out in the universe, right? Yeah. The yeah. karma's out there. Yeah. I, I feel like you've done that. That's happened to you before. It has. Why do you think I'm afraid of it? The hawker could be strong with that one. I do like how they were able to shut down the run in this last game against Taylor. So it does give me yes. hope that they can do that against Henry because I, I do think that they're relatively similar. They are. I mean, clearly um, Derek Henry is the, or has been traditionally the better back of the two. A lot of people talking about the potential fall off for Derek Henry this year. Uh, after watching the offensive coordinator pull his head out of his butt in the third quarter, when it was too late and start running Henry and him starting to rip off a few, um, that might be, uh, greatly exaggerated his, uh, falling off a cliff after so much usage, mm -hmm. but yeah, the defense does seem to have the ability, at least with Taylor to shut down the run, especially between the tackles. And, uh, that would bode well going up against Henry also too, that Titans offensive line looked bad looked really bad in the Colts were at least competent. And that's another thing that gives me hope is that, yeah, if the Colts line is as legit as everybody was thinking and the Titans line is worse, I mean, it's mm -hmm. easy to see that watching these two opening games, then our, our defensive line should look better. A plus B yeah. is C. Absolutely. And that's how it's going to go. And, you know, write it down. It's, yeah. it's happening, but it all does start and stop there. If you can get Derrick Henry off to a slow start, not necessarily bottle him up, but just get him off to a slow start. We need the offense to come out and do what it did this last week and have a hot start out of the gate, put the pressure on to put the ball in the air for the Titans. And at that point, I think that's more or less a win for the Seahawks. I, I think it is doable for the Seahawks offense. If, if they, if they are able to do what they did against the Colts defense, this Titans defense, there's not the number of players that really even scare you. You, you have Bud Dupree, who's their pass rusher that they mm -hmm. uh, signed from the Steelers. Steelers, yep. And they got yeah, that's where they that's where the list ends. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, I mean, that Jeffrey Simmons, a young defensive tackle. Uh, Harold Landry is their other pass rusher, pretty young. But I guess they got Janoris Jenkins at corner. Byard he at got safety. dominated by Hopkins, man. Yeah, he was good in the run game, I thought. Sure. But look, that defensive line looked bad. It yeah. looked really poor. And in the Cardinals offensive line, let's face it, that's not a bunch of world beaters over there. No, they're okay. And they're okay. Now, there are some plays where Kyler scrambled around a little bit, right? And did <laughs> <Some>. his thing. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, some, it, but there was a number of them. Maybe he scrambled and then he stood there for 15 seconds, but he had all day. A lot of times, sometimes when he was scrambling too, there was no reason to scramble. No. The protection was really good. Yeah. He ran around a lot. He, the yeah. funny thing was, is that every time he ran for a first down, it was a holding penalty on the offense too. Yeah. Well, that's what you get for cheating Cardinals. But between the defensive line, not looking like much, the linebackers looking as average as anything. And then. I understand Baird had the pick in the Cardinals game, but the secondary is nothing to write home about either. Uh, this feels like a much more advantageous matchup for Russ and company coming into this game. 
You're not worried about a Bradley McDougal revenge game? No, oh, no. I didn't realize he had uh, made it onto the Titans roster. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's playing some strong safety. I think he okay. must be playing nickel or something. Cause he only had about 50% of the snaps on defense. Yeah. Or maybe they're rotating safeties or something. Yeah. Something I'm like not that. Sure. Yeah. But, but the other, the other thing too, that watching the Cardinals play with the Titans there, the thing was, is that they had no running game. The Cardinals had no running game. Right. They, except for I mean, Kyler. Except for Kyler. Yeah. Which I guess if you want to call that part of the running game, sure. Fine. But as far as actually handing off to a back, I mean, the Seahawks have a far superior running game and that's going to make it even tougher for the Titans in this matchup this week. I'm excited to be there. Me too, man. I'm fired up. I'm uh, really excited about seeing all the other little flockers getting to hang out with you guys. Uh, I don't know what the weather is looking like though. Where have we looked at a weather report? Weather, like we got a plan for weather. Yeah. Cause our seats are out in, uh, they're not, un- I, I didn't say there was a plan. I just wanted to know what I'm uh, dealing with. Cause last uh, time we got dumped on. There is rain in the forecast for Sunday in Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can I sit away from everybody? <laughs> our, well, you know, our season tickets, uh, nobody's taken those yet. So, uh, maybe, the... we, maybe we just go sit in our own seats that we own and, yeah. uh, sorry, flockers. <laughs> no, we check in like every quarter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> only if it's raining, otherwise we'll be out there with you. We're, oh. we're, we're, we're fair, fair weather pa- uh, podcast hosts. <laughs> L- literally fair weather. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll be out there. You oh. know, we'll be out there. Okay. There's no way we're going to sit over there. Okay. Are you, yeah. Are you sure? Uh, no, but I thought I would end it with that. Thanks. <laughs> a couple things people need to know because this is opening weekend at Lumen Field. Uh, there's some there's some vaccination requirements or test of COVID test requirements. Oh, there's so you you want to make sure you bring your vaccine card. It can be print. It can be the actual card. It can be a photo of the card. It can be a digital card. Uh, or like the digital proof mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is for 12 and up. It can be the one you written wrote in crayon. <laughs> sounds like, it sounds like about anything will pass. I, well, I wouldn't chance that I, I would uh, oh, but, go colored pencil then. Okay. It looks more, it looks more professional. Or you could, I, the COVID like a COVID test will do if you've had one taken within 72 hours. So if you, there if you, you get tested and you bring, Either a, a photo of it printed or a digital version of a of a negative test that'll get you in too. Okay, so basically, either be a two poke team guy, or <laughs> go and get a test and bring it along with you the yeah. results. Okay, and it has to be a real test. It can't be a home test or self test. Oh, are we okay? That's what it says on the thing. Wow, how are there more restrictions on the uh, test part than there are on the vaccination card <laughs> requirements? <laughs> well, it, I, it doesn't say it can't be written in crayon or colored pencil, but I, I feel okay. like that goes without saying. I, I don't know that it does. I, I, that'd be one of those, like, you didn't say. So One, one thing, though, too, to, um, to be aware of, because I, 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 I talked to some people who they were getting their second shot, but it was like the week before the game. Get the get the test because I think the, the, they count it two weeks after the last dose for the, for the vaccine card. Okay. Sure. Just, just to have it just in case. So you don't get to the gate and be like, well, oh, I got, no, I think, I'm a, I'm a two shot team guy, but it was only yeah. a week ago. And they're like, well, it was only a week ago. Yeah. I think, I, I think your recommendation is spot on. I just, the, uh, the whole two weeks thing is seems a bit ludicrous, but whatever. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV and and five and up or masking. Okay. That was my next question. Do we, do we got to do the mask thing? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what we got to do. But it says, except while actively eating or drinking in a stationary location. So basically I need to have a beer in my hand at all times. <laughs> right. Okay. Perfect. Two shot team guy, beer in hand at all times. Absolutely. Yeah. It'll be fine. And we can have a great time at the game. Yeah. Because we are watching live football. Absolutely. It's going to be, it's going to be great. I'm super excited. Uh, I feel better about the idea of 
the Titans in our first home game after watching the Titans this last week. But then again, you can get that fool's gold of the, you know, oh, just a week uh, one overreaction, right? That was the stat that I heard today. The Titans are seven and zero oh after losing by double digits. On a Thursday <laughs> when <laughs> it's cloudy. Yeah. Something okay. like that. Yeah, that sounds like one of those stats that really. Oh, it's, I think it's a legit stat. That's that's a Is bounce it? back from a bad win stat. Under it was under it was specifically under Mike Vrabel. Okay, that helps. But again, you know, Flathead Lake is the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. It's, that's not man-made. Yes, that's a lot of qualifiers. <laughs> this is with yeah. Mike Vrabel. After a big loss, they bounce back and get the win. Okay. All right. Well, that's. Uh, I guess what's going to be extra fun for me is when the Seahawks uh, put an end to this phony ass stat. Yeah. Well, then maybe they can bounce back after this double digit loss. And then it will, will and then they will be eight and one and it's still a good thing for them. Yeah. Uh, all I wish for the Titans after this game is a lot of wins because they've yet to play the Rams and the Niners as well. We want so, them to win those games. Yeah. I wish them the best. I hope they find their mojo. Right after this. Exactly. On to the second half of the show. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So I have an idea. What? For a segment for the second half of the show for the rest of the season. Oh, yeah. An NFC West roundup. And we talk about the NFC West teams real quick. Oh, yeah. We did that last season. Okay, but I mean, like, did we make it like a thing that we made sure to do? And it was like, I mean, I have it in my show notes. Oh, well, okay. Well, never mind. I don't think we called it anything, but I think no, we did that's it. what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> like I want to make it a thing so that we don't forget. Yeah, I have after the break NFC West watch. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, maybe uh, we should uh, we should put this in as the beginning of the second half of the show so that everybody else can have a good chuckle at my swings too. All right, we're back. Second half of showtime. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as you may or may not heard, uh, I had a new idea for the NFC uh, West roundup segment at the beginning of the second half of the show. Every time it's a really um, good idea. It's a really yeah. good idea that we, that's how it felt after our conversation that we implemented last year. It was a good one. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, let's you know what people, you know, teams. What, the thing is people probably forgot about it. Uh, yes. This year new to the show Adam Emmert's idea of an NFC West watch segment to start the second half of the show. Yes. Like an official, we're making it official now, which makes it feel uh, more important. So really good idea, dude. I, I'm glad we workshopped that um, all last season. Apparently let me ask you this, Brandon. So obviously the NFC West had a good week overall. Yeah. Stupid other teams. I know where would you rank the teams in order of impressive performances? Uh, Rams first, probably. See wow. how? Yeah. Probably. Wow. I am stunned by that. Okay. I, I expected that game to be closer. Hmm. So it's more based off of my expectations. Okay. The 49ers getting up early on the Lions. I actually thought that I, I picked the Lions to win that game <laughs> just because I, I didn't think that uh, the Niners would put that many points on the board. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it was close makes it, it vindicated me a little bit. Absolutely. And then, yeah, the Cardinals, I, the way the Titans played, I don't know whether or not to be impressed about the Cardinals. Right. So Rams, us, Cardinals Niners. Okay. Mine's very different. Uh, I actually, if I'm being honest, you injected me with truth serum. I'd say for me, it was the Cardinals. Now, whether or not that was the Cardinals having a great game or the Titans stinking up the joint, and maybe it's a little column, a, a little column B, maybe it's just, you know, Titans stinking up the joint, but just on paper on surface level, uh, you know, they were clicking more or less on offense and their defense looked pretty good. I mean, they really did shut down the Titans for the most part. It was a road so, win. Yeah. So to me, that was the most complete performance. Uh, then Seahawks, I thought uh, the offense showed great balance. 
It, uh, it was explosive. The defense was stingy and they didn't, you know, blow out the Colts. Like the Cardinals blew out the Titans. And that would be the only reason I have them where they are. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have the Niners. Um, their offense looked pretty good out of the gate. I mean, nobody got close to Jimmy. And so he was able to, you know, pick apart the defense pretty well. And I mean, that's kind of the story of the Niners right there. Sure. Uh, and then their defense while looking good early, let their foot off the gas and they gave up a bunch of points late to Jared freaking God. So Who that definitely just about had him in position to tie the game at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I rank this, you know, a lot further down. Um, and then on top of all of that, losing Barrett at corner for the year and then losing Mostert for the year. Like those are two big injuries for them. Yeah. I think Mitchell will be good. And they got sermon. I, I think they're going to be fine at running back. Well, so here's the thing about running backs. Like if Kyle is anything like his dad, I remember his dad having Orlandis Gary rush for a thousand yards. Mike Anderson rushed for a thousand yards. Yeah. Uh, and those guys went anywhere else and were not good. Peyton Hillis rushed for a thousand yards. Exactly. So yeah, I have a feeling that running back is a little bit more of a plug and play thing in the uh, Shanahan family. So that definitely probably not nearly as devastating as some might think right out of the gate, but uh, Verrett's huge. That That's a big loss for them. It's big it, because their secondary was questionable at best going into mm -hmm. that game. Yeah. And I'm still not uh, sold on this two quarterback thing, man. Yeah, I so I did not watch a ton of it. Me neither. So I don't know exactly how they did the rotation, but I know I did see that uh, Trey Lance had a, a touchdown pass on his first throw. He did. Uh, I talked to a 49ers fan today that uh, I often do work for, and uh, his response to Trey Lance's debut was, I hope Jimmy can start for like nine or 10 weeks, and they just stop putting him in there. And then throw the kid in after that. It, that's, He's not ready. Yeah. That's well, it's kind said. of the logical progression. And you had to expect that with the fact that he only played one game last season. And he's only played, right. what was it, 13 total starts in college? Yeah. 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 So. It's pretty rough. It, it's. They made the right call not moving on from Garoppolo in the offseason. I guess. I mean you don't trade all that draft capital for somebody like Trey Lance. who's that raw and could potentially be a giant bust. And then, you know, put all your hopes in a guy who can't stay healthy. And <laughs> even when he is, if you put a hand in his face, he craps his pants and throws a pick. Cause you know, that's coming, you know, bad Jimmy's coming. It's coming. Yeah. They, they'll then, they'll uh, get some games of it. The Rams were my least impressive. Really? Okay. Really? And the, the reason for that is, with Andy Dalton at the helm of that bears offense, like they should go nowhere. They should score no points. Mm. And yet they held onto the ball a lot and they were moving up and down the field. Montgomery was getting his, they moved the ball on the Rams uh, all day. Their defense was not impressive. I guess their defense was, I, I was more focused on the offense for the Rams. Right. And then that's where the real indictment is. Hooray! They played, you know, ping pong, laser tag, catfish, and football, throwing the ball all over the yard, and Stafford having two chucks deep. Neat. What happened in the run game? Uh, diddly catfish. Poo. That's what happened in the run game. Yeah, but they were playing they the Bears' the defensive line. So. Oh, well, I think that you know, if you're going to try and run it against the Bears, they're going to shut it down. Look, I, I have been talking about this for a while. Like, I think their run game is really going to struggle and it showed up in this game. I, and we only have one game to work off of. Right. But yeah. their, their, their run game was really bad. And if they have to go, you know, back to the future style offense and throw the ball all around the yard, Stafford is either going to get hurt or he's going to make the big mistake in the big moment that really holds them back. So to me, that was the least impressive performance. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't. <laughs> you see, you're pulling from my preseason pessimism now. 
And you sound like how I sounded in the off season. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's fair. I just don't know if it's fair to pull that based off of what we saw from him. Really? Because now you're forecasting what I already not? you're you're forecasting what I already forecasted in the off season. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Good job. Like uh, you're <laughs> like. Do you need a pat on the back? Like it's yeah, because you it's crapped just, all over my my ideas this off season. I did not. Fine. Yeah. You're like I, you're like Matt Stafford's going to be awesome. He can throw the ball way better than Jared Goff. Da, 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 I, da. Said, I said he was an upgrade over Goff, that he's more talented than people think, but he is injury prone and he does make the big stake, big mistake in the biggest moments, but he's slightly underrated. Okay. Can all those things be true at the same time? Maybe. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the schedule for week two. We got, oh, the Colts play the Rams now in LA. Go Colts. <laughs> Go Colts. Yeah, that'll be a... See, now that's going to be curious to see what they do mm -hmm. with uh, after seeing what we saw. Okay. Yes. San Francisco is playing in Philly. That will be pseudo-interesting. Philly's not good. I know. I, yeah, it's just because they played the Falcons that they look good, right? Yeah, and like a lot of those points came late to make it like that lopsided. It, that game was closer for a little longer than you might think. See, I didn't watch any of the Falcons Eagles, but I, 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 I have a hard time thinking the Eagles are that good. Yeah. Uh, air yards per attempt for Jalen hurts in that game was something like 3.7. <laughs> I was going to be generous and say five. No, it was under four. That's bad. That's really bad. And the Vikings are in Arizona. No oh, catfish. Man. God, the Vikings are God awful. They hate each other. They hate their coach. The coach hates them. <laughs> like they're, they're in a bad place, man. They're a mess. You think that defense could actually give them? No. A... <laughs> <laughs> you think Dalvin cook against the Cardinals? No. <laughs> oh, what about the receivers against the Arizona? It DBs? doesn't matter. The whole team hates their own, their own quarterbacks. They all hate each other. Yeah. Like that. There's the, th those are the worst team vibes I've seen in a long time. Like to start a season. Like I've seen teams get there by the end of the season, but at the very beginning, man, they, they look terrible in the preseason, terrible in week one. This is going to be one of those years where the Cardinals go like five and oh, and everybody gets excited. And then they wet the bed going down the stretch. And they did just enough for Kingsbury to come back for another year. They still almost won that game against the Bengals. They almost won that game against the Bengals. That's what you just said. As, yeah. if, as if that was like, here's some credit. <laughs> I thought the Bengals played okay. Yeah. That yeah, was one game that okay I, I, I did the watch. the Bengals. Yeah. I, I watched the fourth quarter of that game. That's a bad loss. Yeah. All right, Vikings. Come on, bounce back. Yeah. They're eight hey, out of those three teams. They're the ones I have the least confidence in uh, helping us out this next week. You know, under Mike Zimmer, they are undefeated coming off overtime losses against the Bengals. Really? What about in the West Coast time zone? <laughs> that I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Rams, do they get the Colts in Indy or are they back in uh, everybody's wet dream of a stadium that we can't stop talking about? Uh, in LA. Yeah, they're in LA. Man, the Rams got give. They open their first two games at home in their new stadium. Yeah, how about that? Huh. Hmm. Interesting. And then you hear like people talking. Oh no! These, oh no! I guess they do go on the road in Indy. Good, but they have three of their first four at home. Okay, that's still a gift. Yeah. God, and I have to hear any more about the Stafford McVeigh mind meld, like how they're working together as peers and like they're just they're just like McVay the finally has a guy he finally Hardy. has a guy that he can you know share a mind with he's yeah he's finally got a guy who can rise up to his level of offensive genius yeah. black 
That's not going to get old at all. Golly, that was impossible to watch. They can lose an indie and then get smoked by the Bucks, and Ooh. then oh, and then they play the Cardinals, and then Chandler Jones can have another four sack game against Stafford. There we go. They'll have two out of the way then before they play the Seahawks. I like it. So, uh, can we talk about some of the other bigger, bigger NFC teams as well here? What, like, like the Packers getting smoked? I want to save that for last because it's the most fun. <laughs> but let's talk. Let's talk about Tampa. Let's talk about the Saints. Those are probably the two other teams that people are fired up about. Tampa looked damn good. I suppose Cowboys were just trying to pull ahead at the end, but you leave any time on the clock for Tom. Yeah, you knew they were going to win that game. And he's throwing lasers all over the yard. I know. It's annoying that he can be that good. (laughs) Like some long, nice touchback. His deep ball has looked better in week one than it has in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Saints. Saints. Um, So the Saints got good Jameis for a game. They got good defense. They got great defense. Their defense looked a lot better than I had expected. Yeah. But I don't know how much credit to give them. You think that it was because of poo poo pouty face Aaron Rodgers that that is the reason why that defense was so good? Okay, let's get to the Packers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the same game. <laughs> I know. I know. That guy, that I, I'm just trying to, you know, convey my excitement. Um <laughs> Was it? Was there anything more gratifying short of the Seahawks win this weekend than watching man bun, pouty face Aaron Rodgers come out and just suck balls? Like that was a really bad performance. And I'm going to rip on some people for framing things in this way, like the best and the worst here in my do better. But like calling a spade a spade, like this was, that was God awful. Yeah. He still had a better yards per attempt, though, than uh, Jalen Hurts. <laughs> Jalen Hurts. That's pretty funny. But so we talked about the Vikings. Like, I've never seen a team that hates each other so much, like right out of the gate. I have never seen a team that meh each other so much right out of the gate. Nobody seemed to care at all about anything. Aaron Rodgers. I, I don't know what to think about this guy. I, He's a douche. I I understand that part of it, but okay. Um, he's also man. He, you know how pouty Cam Newton could get. Yeah, I feel like he's eclipsed that. Ooh, he's right there. If he hasn't, I think he's. I think he's past it. Well, and the other thing too that is a parallel with Cam as well is once again Aaron fell behind. And that was that. Yeah. Over. Over. Just done. Yeah. Like, I don't get it. And just looking at the, uh, the Packers offense looks simplistic as hell. Like it looked as predictable as the day is long for that Tampa defense, man. Mm -hmm. Like they, even the little, you know, outlet receivers and stuff were just blanketed. Aaron, is this stat line, right? Aaron Jones, five attempts, nine yards. Yes. Wow. They couldn't do anything. Dylan didn't have much more success, if any. No, he was. Well, he almost had five yards per carry. It was uh, Hill. But he came in uh, when they put in love. Oh, okay. And so at the end, he was was barely getting three yards per carry. I I watched a little bit of Jordan Love to see what he could do. And yeah, it's all right. Did did he do anything? he, He only missed two of his throws. Um. He was almost 10 yards per attempt. Okay. Yeah. So he's throwing it downfield a little bit. All right. But it was just a joyous event to watch the Packers implosion. Cause it looked just so obvious that, and I hate like tying storylines to teams and being like, Oh, that's the thing. But boy, howdy. Did it not look like this whole team is just worn out on Aaron Rodgers? Like, they're going to bounce back though against the lions now. No, and- they're not. No, no, they might win, but it's not going to be a performance. That, like it's going to be an ugly win. Okay. Yeah. I hate that. They travel to San Fran. The NFC North might be the worst division in football at the end of the year. 
Ooh. The Packers win the division with what? 10 wins? No, it'll probably be the Bears when they finally bring in Justin Fields in like week 12 and he rattles off like, you go, you know, he goes like three and two down the stretch and they eke out the division title. I don't think that the Packers can be that bad. I don't know, man. That they're on my watch list, juju. though. They're, they're, they are on the watch list for performing that poorly to start the season. Yeah, that was a stinker. How do you not be ready for week one of the NFL? Oh, I got an idea. Maybe have your quarterback throw a world-class hissy fit and then threaten to go host Jeopardy instead of play catfish in football and then show up at the last catfish a minute and expect everything to run crisp. Oh, oh, and fire your defensive coordinator who actually did an okay job while he was there and replace him with, I don't know, whatever that was. Yeah, not to name any specific team, but just as a general example of things that, that could happen right. in an offseason. I mean, I'm just saying hypothetically, if it were to happen to not be ready for week one, it might look a little like that. What do you say we welcome some new members of the flock? Oh, that sounds great because I'm riding high. Oh, we got lots of people. We got people coming in this week. We got our executive producers, DCH, Dustin Mock, Brian Shaw, Kevin Watterson, Jake Burdine, And we got our 144 contributors for the year, Brian Lowry, John DeSmartu. Uh, we got, oh, uh, Pepper Horton came in too, but we'll get to those donations. Uh, we got Kevin Moore, who's back in the flock at 1212. And Kevin says, hey, fellas. I started a new business a while back and stopped all recurring expenses to save cash during startup. We are now rolling pretty good over here at More Bros Construction, so it's time to start supporting you guys again. Sorry for the pause, but I am stoked to be back. Keep up the good work and go Hawks. Good to have Kevin back, right? And then also, too, to know that, or, well, not to know because we knew it already, that More Brothers Construction is one of the finest construction companies that you could possibly contract out to do things on your home. More Brothers Construction, or guys, you should look in. Just make sure you spell it B-R-O-Z, more bros, and tell them the Seahawkers podcast sent you. That's right. And the Z makes it better. So, yes, more bros construction. Did I get enough uh, in there? To, I think like, so. For I, think we, I think we nailed Good. it. All right. Well, Kevin earned it, so I wanted to make sure. Kevin Sellers came in at 30 pounds. Welcome to the flock to Kevin. Heck yeah, man. Appreciate the pounds. Jeff Scott is in. Oh, there's, there's another executive producer to add to our list for this month. Jeff Scott comes in, says, hey, guys, happy Blue Friday. I normally like to renew my sponsorship around my birthday, but I'm still a procrastinator at heart. So I sent it today, nine days late. Also attached a picture of my annual cake a la mode just for Adam. You guys are not only better at life than Skip Bayless, but better at podcasts than a lot out there. Thanks for keeping the offseason entertaining. I also have to clear my Hakra from the preseason. My anniversary is on 814. And this year, my wife and I took a kid free trip to Vegas for the weekend. Well, I knew there was a game against the Raiders, but I was too excited about kid free time with my wife. I'd never connected the fact that the game was being played in Vegas. So we're walking around greeting all the 12s we see, excited to see so many fans. Then one couple asked if we were going to the game. Our response? The stupidest blank stares on our faces didn't <laughs> click until that moment. Face palm. So I'll take the blame for that game. Lastly, I just listened to the latest episode. Great as always. Adam always makes Brittany sound pretty cool. But now hearing her chime in about the burritos <laughs> for calling you out, for not calling to confirm the ETA, she is better at life than Skip Bayless. Looking forward to seeing the Hawks prove the stupid analysts wrong with a Super Bowl ring this year. Go Hawks. All right, I was going to give Jeff some like uh, reprieve there for not knowing there was a game taking pit place in L.A. because who pays attention to L.A. Raiders, right? Like Vegas. That'd be, yeah. Yeah. L.A., L.V., same okay, thing. Whatever. See, exactly. They're so inconsequential like being there that I don't even get the uh, acronym correct. But uh, then he brought up Brittany's appearance, which y'all took a little too much joy in. I'm not sure uh, I'm good with this, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, not only did y'all take uh, uh, too much joy in it, but I think she did too. In all the responses that you guys had in the Ring of Honor and the praise, um, it's uh, it's definitely taken our relationship to a different level. Uh, and I, I don't know how I feel about her coming on the podcast here in the future as she sits here and chuckles at me from the couch. 
Uh, but if any of you uh, wish to hear more of Brittany's musings about what an idiot I am, uh, she is coming to the Titans game. So, Acid Queen in person. In person. She'll be signing autographs. Yes, she'll be signing pictures. autographs. She's great at doing selfies with people. Nice. Yeah. yeah. See, now that brings yeah. up another topic because, okay, so people are wondering what the gathering situation is. And mm. I think what we're trying to do is we're shooting for a four o'clock on Saturday get together. Okay. That means you and I are going to have to leave Montana pretty early to try and get there by four. I'm probably going to leave Friday night okay. with the camper. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the bootleg football guys are planning the the Saturday event. So we, we may join forces on Saturday. Nice. I don't have the location nailed down yet, though. Right. But, Although, yeah, you can't give that out. Otherwise, we might be infiltrated. Well, I just, but, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's more cloak and dagger. Don't, oh, okay. don't make it. Yeah. I'm trying to cover for you. But just email me, you know, gohawks at seahawkerspodcast.com if you want to be aware of, of what we're doing on Saturday. And I'll make sure I, I let everybody know. All right. Perfect. Sunday, uh, my normal tailgate is, it's, it's not going to be there so we need a tailgate spot if we're going to tailgate on sunday okay yeah. again we oh, may I mean, we may join up with the bootleg football guys i haven't squared it away sure and that would then, be a terrible time i would enjoy that so yeah but if if somebody else has a tailgate idea okay let us know we'll be on board yeah. that sounds great yeah it's a different year not everything's quite as consistent at the stadium as uh once was i know when you take a year off things change absolutely yeah and then post game, I don't know. I may hit the road after the game. Yeah, I may have to as well. There's an emergency job down by the Dallas, Oregon that I would have to maybe start on Monday. Ooh, okay. So to get a little ways down the road, at least towards there, so I could be there in the morning. Would be cool. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> it's all up in the air, people. It is, except for it'll be celebrating a victory. That's the one thing we know for sure. John DeSmartu, who I mentioned, executive producer, came in with an annual 145 44 donation. That's 12 12 a month for a year. So thank you to John. Welcome to the flock. Although already in the flock. Yeah. I, I recognize John's name. Yes. In his amazing contribution. Carly Perkins in at $3 a month. Welcome to the flock to Carly. Heck yeah, Carly. About time. Julio Carenza comes in. At 145.44, so executive producer for the month as well. Welcome to the flock, Julio. Okay, see, this feels like another bad omen for me. Like, we had a Julio come in, like, at executive producer level the day before, or the, you know, the week of the Julio game. Does it counteract it? Yes. Exactly. Yes, it does. See, Julio saved my hawker. That's what happened here. That's what happened. Dude, thank you. Thank you, Julio. Yeah, I did. I was reading that all wrong. Sam Rukeyser came in at five dollars. Oh, and Sam was uh, was pitching me this app that he is a part of. Mm. It's the Air with two A I R and another R app. Okay. I don't know. I'm checking it out. Okay. It's supposed to be for podcasting. Apparently, you can send audio messages to people. Ooh. I haven't okay. finished. I, I just haven't finished messing around with it yet. Oh, well, sounds very interesting though. Yeah. yeah. Let me know what you find out. Okay. Yeah. Mike Ball comes in at 1212 a month, says, good morning, guys. I listen all the way from the East Coast here in Charleston, South Carolina, and just wanted to say thank you for all that you do and keep up the great work. Your podcast has provided me helpful insight and much needed laughter over the last two years. The Twelves congregation is strong in Charleston, and I try to share your podcast with any potential flockers that I run into. I love being able to find someone that hates the freaking Rams as much as I do out here. It is convicting, but I finally got off my ass and subscribed and stopped being a freeloader. I run some very popular brunch restaurants out here called Vicious Biscuit and have actually run into numerous 12s on vacation from Seattle here in our restaurants, hoping to put one out there one day soon. Please hit me up if you guys are ever in the Charleston area and I'll roll out the red carpet. Please keep the amazing sports hate for the rest of our division and the rest of the D-bags in the NFC. It always gives me a great chuckle while I'm driving. Looking forward to the next installment. Go Hawks and F the Rams. Thankful in Charleston, Mike Ball. 
<laughs> Go Hawks, Mike. Hey, a uh, couple things in there. I mean, vicious biscuit. That sounds delicious. And I'm sure it is. It is the know, most vicious food. biscuit you'll have on the east side of the Mississippi. Charleston. Like, I'm not, everybody on this podcast knows I'm not the biggest fan of the South. Just kind of not for me. Yeah. But Charleston in the French Quarter in New Orleans, that's actually cool places. Those are cool places. I really enjoy Charleston. That's a cool place to be. And to know that, that there's a large contingency of Hawks fans there, that only reinforces my opinion about the city. Oh, well, we're naming cool places in the South. Uh, Georgia. I named them all. <laughs> no, no. The What's the capital of Georgia? It's Savannah, yeah? Yeah, I think so. I know it's not Atlanta. That would be... It's either Athens or Savannah. I'm pretty sure it's Savannah. I think it's Savannah. I think Savannah is the cool place in Georgia that I was at. Like they have a really. It's impossible. Cool... It's no. impossible. I, I, there's only two. I listed them. There might be room for a top. I don't know. No. There... <laughs> no. Can you have a Mount Rushmore of of South towns? I don't think you can because there's only two. Uh, where? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Who I'm moving on to, to Hector. Block? Hector yeah. gave us a raise from three to twelve. Thanks to Hector for the raise. Heck yeah, buddy. Uh, looking forward to having you in the Ring of Honor, my man. And this was a big week. So if I forgot anybody's invites to the yes. Facebook group, if I forgot invites to the Discord, send me an email. Yeah. Hey, our our guy from Denver sent me the the email asking to get in the Discord so he can, you know, stream the... the yeah. It. There was some blowback in the Ring of Honor on this. Yeah, there was. Yeah. I don't know. I think... Uh, do we allow democracy to prevail or do we like actually just what we, we, we listen now. to the the majority that's the most extreme right yes, we listen to the I minority love, that's the most extreme i love operating a country like that a podcast like that my home like that i think it's perfect i don't see what could go wrong here. all right yeah. well now i now i gotta kick him out of the discord yeah, or maybe not i just changed my mind again uh winner of the tiny pieces of seahawk stuff ray was the winner for august you got a good one too. Got a good one. Uh, also, got an email from Kelly and Spanaway who donated last week at Permadude on Twitter. Dookie Bear here. Love all your shows. Truth be told, I've been listening to your show since it came out. I'm a truck driver. I listen to hundreds of hours of podcasts every year. But if it makes you feel any better, you are the first show I have ever given money to. I will take wow. that sticker if it's not too late. Thanks for the quality football talk and entertainment. Dude, that is, I consider that to be some of the highest praise that we could get, to be honest. Because as a truck driver, no, as somebody who drives a lot for work, but not nearly as much as a truck driver, I'm like, good Lord, right? Right. Um, you listen to lots and lots of things. And, you know, if you're a podcast listener and we're the first one out of all those podcasts for all those hours, for all those years that you've given money to, that must mean we are legit awesome. I've mentioned this before. I love all our truck driver listeners because my dad was a truck driver. And yes. so I always, I always love hearing from the truck drivers. Absolutely. You have a soft spot for that for sure. I do. I do. Uh, also, shout out to Terrence Robinson, who I donated last week to fadwinachi.bandcamp.com forward slash subscribe. I need to try and remember to put that in the show notes. Okay. So Terrence does the oh the the daily notes for field goals. Oh, right on the the clips. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, that, that's I, I want to make sure to promote his his Bandcamp page. Heck yeah, man! And Bandcamp's a good time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I I know you don't know, but I know, and it's a good time. <laughs> no matter true. what movies tell you. I had a good time. I think the movies do tell you that it's a good time. They tell you it's a weird time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, Adam. We we have quite a few comments for mailbag. I but we are running out of time. I got to get the kids to bed. Do you want to do a bonus mailbag episode tomorrow? Dude, that's a great idea that you had. <laughs> all on your own. <laughs> I didn't edit it out that your suggestion at all. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's totally 100% my idea. It was so organic and just came up and out of your mouth that it was just, it's great. I think it's an amazing idea. I'm in full support of it. I know that would be surprising, but yeah, 
a bonus show for everybody with uh, all the emails, uh, do better, better at life, uh, all that stuff. Oh, we're gonna. Oh, so we're gonna we're gonna put off do better and better at life too. Okay. Yeah. You know what? You had a good idea before on just passing on the mailbag. Yeah. Just closing the show here. I I'm in full support. Yeah. See, this all works out for everybody's deal. You get to put your kids to bed. Your wife's not mad at you for doing podcasting too long. And all the little flockers get an extra show. And with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.